Okay, let me add a few comments on the uncertainty relation that we have derived last time. Okay, so a few comments because we have really finished the construction of the uncertainty relation as developed by Heisenberg. So we have two observables which are not compatible and therefore we cannot simultaneously diagonalize them or in other words we cannot simultaneously measure them with precision. So what we have obtained as uncertainty relation was the following delta a squared times delta b squared is equal or larger than 1 over 4 expectation value of A and B squared plus 1 over 4 expectation value mod square of the expectation value of the anti-commutator of delta A and delta B. This is in its most generality. That was the expression that we have obtained last time. Notice that this is the anti-commutation of the delta A, delta B. Perhaps you may wish to remember what are the definition of these. There's an identity in here, obviously. And similarly, B minus B expectation and identity. And those are the expressions entering into this general formulation of the uncertainty relation. Being Hermitian, the square, it is a real number, positive real number. Therefore, if we drop it, drop this additional piece, we even further reduce the right-hand side, and it reduces the well-known form of the Heisenberg. So that was the result we obtained. We further, it was too quick perhaps in the last minute or so of the last lecture. So as this is positive definite, obviously, being the anti-commutator that's A times B plus B times A, it's a Hermitian thing, expectation values are, most squares are, expectation values are real, so you drop a real positive square and you reduce it further. So the last comment which I have to add so this one is, to answer the following question, what is the special case in which the equality sign holds? Well, this is an important question in a different context. For example, the uh, coherent states or squeezed states, which, are, which play such an important role in the quantum optics, is follows from here. That's the reason why I wanted to spend a few minutes before turning our attention to another subject. But notice that when I say equality, I may mean the equality in here or the stronger equality in here, because this is stronger. You are dropping an additional positive definite part from the right hand side. If you look at the equality in here, then the first line, which followed from the Schwartz inequality, obviously that requires the following criterion that let me comment on it. It may be too simple for some of you but it's worth spending a few minutes. Let's 
Remember the three-dimensional Euclidean analogy, which was A, B, cosine theta. And you take the square, so that you don't really worry about the signs or everything. This thing is now, cos cosine squared of theta is less than one. Cos theta is less than one larger than minus one. I want to get rid of those ambiguities. So if, if as this is less than one, the right hand side was a squared and b squared. So that's a very nice example because what we have done is we instead consider the, those vectors in the, well, Hilbert space, alpha and beta. And they are in principle infinitely, infinite dimensional, although we also consider the finite dimensional cases. So that's, a, that's the Schwarzian inequality, the analog of this, which was the Schwarzian inequality that we started with. But here it's a good point. Under what circumstances the equality holds? The equality holds when a vector is parallel to the b vector, right? Obviously, the angle between them is the zero. Cosine theta is one, so a dot b squared is equal a squared and b squared. If you turn your attention to the Schwarz inequality that we consider, I'm not going to rewrite it to not to lose any time. There, we identified, remember, the, there was an alpha which we identified as delta a times a gamma, a generic one. Beta is delta b gamma. So at this level, let me call this, at, this is the star equation, single star equation. That's the double star equation. At the single star equation, equality holds when beta, I'm using this funny notation, you know what I'm talking about. These beta and alpha are parallel in this Hilbert, in this linear vector space. Meaning that beta is a lambda times alpha. Beta and alpha are given as such. That's the first. If you are at this level, if you are using <coughs> the weak inequality. If you go to the second equality, if you require that in this case, the equality holds That's an important distinction. Sometimes you see that there's not, it's not clear in certain books. So this is much better to go in a, such, a, such a reasoning. That is, in the first case, it is this condition. In the second case, you need an additional condition, right? In addition to this one. That is the vanishing of this term. If it vanishes, you drop it, and if L, A, and B parallel, then you get that right-hand side is equal to the, the, that square. So you need, first of all, there are two conditions that you need. Beta is lambda. Lambda is just any complex number that you have to work out what, are, what is the real or complex nature of it. Second is the other one. You need these two conditions together. If you want, you can write the entire thing. But So when these two conditions are satisfied, then it follows that eh? dA squared expectation. Well, Sakurai's language is a bit cumbersome, you know, that you take the square and take the expectation value. Instead, we could have defined dA squared directly to be the expectation value, blah, blah. But if, as we are using this book as the standard reference, let me stick to it, despite the fact that I don't like that notation. Then, yes, you get B 
the equality. In this case, you get the equality of that. In the first star case, not the stronger one, the weaker one. So I hope this is clear. For instance, an example is <coughs> the usual, really standard example is take A as X, B as PX, or Y and PY, or Z and PZ, as these are the conjugate pairs, and X, PX is IH4, but X and PY are not. Therefore, you can simultaneously measure X and PY precisely with 100% certainty. But anyway, these two obviously satisfy the following commutation relation. <coughs> Therefore, if I go to the second stronger inequality, then I have delta x squared delta px squared is larger than or equal to the commutator is ih bar times an identity, expectation value is ih bar, mod squared is h bar squared divided by 4. <clears throat> that is the stronger, the last version. If I were using a more uh, a weaker language, of course, I would have the anti-commutator of x, px. For instance, what would I have in here? I would have in here the following quantity, x, px, plus px, x, expectation value, right? What is x, px, px uh, times x? You can compute that, but normally this is the weaker inequality, this is the weaker uncertainty, and as this is positive definite, you drop it, and then this becomes larger than h bar squared over 4. So for this uh, very standard, simple example, we see that there are two layer inequalities. The first, the weak inequality is the first one, and then if we further drop this positive definite quantity, then we go to the usual Heisenberg form. For example, I would like to assign a private homework for the class. You may wish to work out, so homework, work out the state in which the oh my god this is a slope language it's not my fault it's a cry it's the following holds obviously what you are going to do is you are going to require that these two conditions are satisfied, you are going to construct the gamma such that delta B, which is delta Px times gamma is lambda times delta X times gamma. Gamma is the state which you would like to construct. That's the first condition. And second condition, which be, you would require is expectation value of delta x, delta px anti-commutator. Oh, sorry, I think I made a mistake in here. Let me correct this. That's more precise in there. Delta x, delta px. Although for the final thing, it's not important. For this intermediate inequality, the explicit form of it is important. So it is this thing. When you satisfy these two conditions simultaneously, you can work out the gamma. And when I say gamma is a state, gamma is a state. As we proceed the next, sub the next hour, we will consider the 
continuous spectra. And we'll introduce the eigenvectors of the position and momentum operators. And we are going to use them as basis vectors. We are going to expand any arbitrary vector in our uh, cat space in terms of those bases. And the coefficients will come out to be the standard wave functions like psi of x or their Fourier transforms phi of p. Then that is how you are supposed to be working out these gamma states. That is, I borrow something from the next hour, that is the wave functions. That is the coordinates of these gamma states in, say, the X spaces. And you'll see that the result will come out to be Gaussian wave packages, or wave packets, have that property that the delta X delta P X product has the minimum value. And so that's why the Gaussian wave packets are known to be minimum uncertainty wave packets. Okay. So it is left as a private homework for your own enjoyment. Uh, and uh, probably some of you have already seen it before anyway. So that is an addendum to the previous hour on the discussion of uncertainty relationship, despite the fact that there were some parasites infiltrating into the lecture. Now we are going to move to a new subject which is the change of basis, or we could have even used the title diagonalization of Hermitian matrices or stuff like that. They are all equivalent. You'll see what I mean as we proceed. Change of basis. And this is a, a subject which is probably well covered in any linear algebra class, and I am sure many of you know it quite well in the mathematical context. But it is so important in physics in many ways, in many aspects, even at the higher level of mixing problem, mass mixing problems, or uh, CP violation, or neutrino oscillations, you name it. All kind of advanced problems involve this kind of diagonalization. Therefore, let's take up that problem in the physical context in our <coughs> cat language and you'll see how nice and simple it is. Now suppose we have <coughs> two incompatible observables. We define the incompatibility. They do not commute. Therefore, they <coughs> eventually simultaneous measurement of these two observables obey the uncertainty relationship that we have described <clears throat> a few minutes ago. And suppose each of them had its own complete orthonormal basis, observables, Hermitian, therefore they have, we have proven those theorems previously, they have complete and orthonormal eigenvectors, which could obviously, because of these features, they can be used <coughs> as bases. That is, you can expand any arbitrary cat in your cat space in terms of any of these bases. Let's call this the old basis. And this one, the new basis. And let's ask the following question. How can we relate these two bases to each other? And you have seen problems of this sort in the Euclid three-dimensional Euclidean space. Uh, but uh, I, I, I don't want to really get into that. Sometimes in the three-dimensional Euclidean space, notation is more cumbersome. But, you know, you have a three-dimensional uh, space of this sort and another one which is rotated with respect to the other. And you can you define the unit vectors along these three legs, EI, EJ, and EK in one case, and rotated one EI prime, EJ prime, and EK prime with 
hats on top because they are unit vectors. And the question of these three unit vectors is related to the previous one, the primed ones to the unprimed ones, is well uh, known. And the notation is cumbersome. Sometimes they have to use the so-called old language, dyadic language. And probably when, if you have seen, taken classical mechanics already at the Goldstein level, then you, have, you must have seen those things. But let me not <coughs> spend any time on that issue. And <coughs> The, so the, that's the change of basis, the title uh, is written as, and that's what I mean really here. How do you go from the eigenvector basis of an observable A to the B, and if it is denoted as U, how do you construct that U in terms of these two basis vectors? <coughs> Sometimes it's called a basis, sometimes it's called a representation, sometimes it's even call, uh, called a slightly more sophisticated language, A diagonal basis or B diagonal basis, etc. But as it, all these terminologies equivalently used, and those uh, will be clear as we proceed further. But the question is how these two uh, bases are related. He states a theorem, and then uh, he expresses the theorem in the following manner. <coughs> there exists claim theorem. There exists a unitary operator U such that B i, any i in this family, is, can be written as A i. Sounds more or less trivial, right? It's so simple, I, it's perhaps a bit misleading to call it trivial. It's so simple. First of all, we have to really <coughs> prove this claim. So the keyword is a unitary operator U, such that any one of the members of this set can be written as a U times the another set from the previous, the old one. Well, here uh, you may not like this demonstration, but the proof goes as follows. V is, he claims that U is given as, this U which does the job for you, is given as K, A, K. Okay. <coughs> Obviously, remember, when we were discussing operators and their matrix representations, etc., we have seen that a product of that form is an operator indeed. It is in this, when it's written in that order. Does the job for us. Once the problem is approached in this manner, we say here is the U, this should do the job for us. Let's demonstrate indeed that that will do the job for us. If I take U, this U, and act on AI, so what do I get? Here is the U, B, K, A, K, sum over K, these indices are important at this level. So that's what we mean. And then you use the orthonormality of the A basis. That's delta KI then carry out the case summation using this Dira the Kronecker delta. So you get indeed bi, right? Delta ki times bk, so only i survives. Indeed, the first part of the claim is demonstrated. And there exists an u, we say this u is the one that which does the job for us, indeed did so. 
The second is to demonstrate demonstration that U is unitary. Okay. Okay, how do we demonstrate that U is unitary? We'll do it in the following manner. We'll take the U and U dagger. By the way, what is U dagger from here? That is, the demonstration of unitarity would mean either we show that u times u dagger is 1, or <coughs> conversely, of course, you need to also <coughs> demonstrate that u dagger and u is 1. Would there be examples that <coughs> it is one-sided, that u, u dagger is 1, but u dagger is not 1? I don't know. Remember an immediate example of that sort. You think of it on your own. So it, is, it should be a two-way. <coughs> equality. So if, what is the U dagger? Well, having you to go to U dagger, you go to the dual space, right? That's dual correspondence. Therefore, for each of those elements, we have to take the dual correspondence, which is this, this cat goes to bra, and this bra goes to the cat. If you recollect our rules of going from the cat to bra space, that is the U dagger. Therefore, if I take the U dagger times U, well, obviously, the case in here both are the dummy indices, and I have to use two different sets of dummy indices, not to get confused. So I have K and L, AL, BL times BK, that is the U now, AK. Use the orthonormality of the B bases now. Remember, notice that in the first half of the theorem, I have used the orthonormality of the eigenvectors of the A operator, A observable. For the unitarity, I am using the orthonormality property of the eigenvectors of the B observable here. <coughs> Then carry out the L summation, set L equals K. AK, AK. And now this is the orthonormality of B basis of B basis. Now I use the completeness of the A bases. You see how beautiful that we use both of these properties in here, completeness of A bases. So the theorem is done. In the U dagger U order, I assign you the private homework of demonstrating that it is the same in if you use the other sign, U, U dagger order. It should be again using orthonormality and the completeness of one basis and the other, then you really demonstrate that this U forms a unitary matrix. Very nice and very simple indeed. <laughs> okay. So what next? <clears throat> What is the <coughs> matrix representation of this U? I have the transformation operator between the two bases U and let's find a matrix representation of it, say in the old basis.
Here is the matrix representation in the old, that is the A basis. What you do is you write the U here. <coughs> BKAK. And then use the orthonormality of the A basis here, delta JK, and carry out the K summation. So AI BJ. Notice that this is an operator, cat first, bra next. These are the matrix element of that operator, so you get complex numbers, right? If it is a table indeed, say U11, U12, U21, U22, both phase. What is the U11? A1, B1. U12, A1, B2. So all these complex numbers form the this matrix representation of the transformation operator U. Okay. <clears throat> now, what next? Okay, let me not use that corner sometimes. It may be not easily visible. Now, how about representing? How about <coughs> changing? When you change the basis, when you have an arbitrary cat vector, you have an expansion of that arbitrary cat vector in one basis and in other basis. And how these coordinates are related? That's the next subject. So let me consider the alpha, an arbitrary state vector. And suppose you have used, for you have expanded it in, the, in terms of the old basis. That's a very operational and direct way of expanding. You insert the identity operator and then you indeed have an expansion in, ter in terms of the coordinates and the basis vector. And then a quick way of getting the coordinates in the B basis is to project this along the BJ. Really, this, these are, instead of going through expanding and doing blah, 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 insert an identity and then project it along the, any arbitrary direction of the new basis. So what do I get then in the left-hand side? BJ alpha, in the right-hand side I have, I, I have I, B, J, A, I, A, I, alpha. Okay, these are the coordinates of the alpha vector in the old basis, old coordinates. And these are the new coordinates. It's a shorthand for saying that coordinates in the new basis, coordinates in the old basis. And what is this? Notice that it is the matrix representation of the U dagger. Correct? U dagger. Yes. Turn it around. <coughs> How do you do that? You turn it around, write complex conjugate, and inside it is U dagger, and then, okay, U, and then take it back using the 
Hermitian conjugation property, Aj u degray. Why I do uh, uh, mention this? Because that's you. Correct? <laughs> what is the reverse order? Aj, Ai, complex conjugate, and you put a u dagger in here, right? And here, Ai, Bj. Or you change this to Bj, Ai, with a complex conjugation, you get that. So what is the, now, uh, let me read this. That's a matrix representation, right? Square matrix. Now, obviously, that must be a column. And a column, so, so that a square multiplying a column from left gives you a column. Indeed, so these are the coordinates in terms of the expressed as a column. So they have the index free index j, and this has the free index j, i is contracted. All obey the usual matrix multiplication rules, so they, they are consistent within themselves. <coughs> so if you write it symbolically following the book, it's nice. So what you have is new coordinates is your dagger times the old coordinates. Okay. <clears throat> okay, now, how does, this is how the coordinates of an arbitrary cat vector is related through this transformation operator. Now question, how the matrix element of arbitrary operators are related? So if we put a title here, transformation of coordinates. Coordinates, of course, quote and quote, right? Expansion coefficients of an arbitrary vector in the basis, but that's, the, that's what I call coordinates. Now, how about the transformation of the matrix representations of arbitrary operator? Short of operators under U, under basis change. Here is an X operator and its matrix representations in the new basis, B, I, B, J. I go from new to old, it's up to you totally, go from old to new. Once you have a well-defined complete autonormal basis, operations are so nice, you use either autonormality or completeness. So how do I proceed? If I'm going to change, find the transformation between the matrix representations, obviously, I need to introduce here a A, L, A, L, a completeness sum of the old bases. Here again, here again, another completeness sum of the A old, rep old representation. Each of them are completeness sum, so identity. So what do I have? Sum over L and K, B, I, A, L, A, L, X, A, K, A, K, B, J. What is AKBJ? It is AI, AK, sorry, U, AK, U, AJ. That's the representation of the X operator in the old basis. And this one is what? This is the U dagger, right? Okay, 
So that's really it in terms of the matrix representations. You may sh you write it in the shorthand as xij new uil old xlk old ukj old. Or symbolically, this is really anal anal analog to u dagger x u, right? If you just uh, convert it in, in terms of not to, to the pure operators. So this is the x prime. Prime is the in the new basis and x is the old basis. Here is explicit form in explicit matrix indices. That is how it looks if you drop the matrix indices and look at the transformation in terms of the operators. Coordinates transform all coordinate times u, or that is all coordinate goes to u times all coordinate, and so that's how the operators transform. <coughs> I think that's a good point to give a short break, and then we will continue the discussion after the short break. <coughs>